Kombucha for gut health. Hello and welcome to another video. My name is Heather and as always I'm reading with a vengeance and I hope you are too. Big love to you OGs who keep coming back and if you're new to my channel, very warm welcome to you. I hope everybody is doing very well. First and foremost, I want to thank all of you who made such lovely, lovely comments on my last couple of videos when I was feeling a little bit doubtful about myself and my channel. I'll talk more about it in my next wrap up where I do a little bit more of admin talk, but I just wanted to say thank you so much. You guys just filled my heart and I absolutely love that you guys love it here and you guys keep me going. You guys reminded me why I'm doing this, why I'm here and why I love this so much. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I think I've got my mojo back. Also, I wanted to say, as you can see here, I changed up my sign, but there was a couple of you who noticed that the A had fallen off my last sign, and I didn't even read that comment until I had probably recorded, I don't know, three videos, so I had to laugh out loud about that, but thank you for the heads up, and uh, I did correct that, but then I ended up thinking to myself, well, I think it's time to change the sign, so here we have it. So let's just get into why we're here. Today, I'm going to talk to you about my favorite books of the third quarter of the year. I usually keep it to five, and today's no different, and I'll talk a little bit about that. I almost added a sixth one. I'll tell you why in a little bit later. These are my five favorite books for July, August, and September. Now, a little bit about how these books make the cut, make it to this list, make it to my favorites. If you are an extremely discerning person, you might think that you would be able to go back and look at my videos and be able to pick which ones were my favorites, but that's not really how my quarterly favorites work. So how I come up with this list is I go back into my Goodreads and I go through all the books that I read in this time period and I see the star ratings because even though I don't give star ratings in my videos anymore, I do it on my Goodreads. And for me, that's more of a reminder for me in the future when I look back at books, only to discern between the two, three, and four star reads. Because if it's a five star, I, I don't need any help remembering that I absolutely love the book and that it was perfect for me. And same thing with a one star, hated it. But I like to be reminded of, did I like it? Did I really like it? Do you know what I mean? And I also give a star rating on Goodreads because, you know, authors pay attention to that stuff and other readers pay attention to that stuff. So I do what I feel I'm supposed to do by using Goodreads. Anyway, so I can go back and pick the five star reads as my quarterly favorites. And then if I don't have five, then I'll go to the four stars and pick from there. But that's not how I do it. I go through there and I start with the five stars, but I usually go through the list and let the books themselves remind me how I felt about them. Because there might be a five star book that didn't make me feel as much as maybe a four star book. And you're probably asking yourself, well, well then what made that four star book a four star book instead of a five star book if you had the feelings. And that's kind of why I stopped using the star system in my videos because in my videos, I'm telling you what I like about them, what I don't like about them. And I think that's really the important thing about reviewing books on this platform. But when I do use the star rating on Goodreads, I'm a little bit more discerning as far as how was the writing style? How were the characters developed? What was the tone? Was the story well fleshed out? all the, the little tick marks that we make to, to rate a book, right? But as far as what makes a book a favorite of mine, if the writing is less than stellar, but I absolutely fell in love with the characters, then I'm going to kind of overlook the little things that will diminish the star rating, if that makes sense. So that's how I pick my favorites to present to you. And to be fair, all the books on these lists are four and five star books. But what I'm saying is, is that a four star book might end up on this list and a five star book might not. So just to clarify, the books that make this list are the books that conjure up feelings even after weeks or months have passed. Okay, clear as mud? Okay, <laughs> let's get on with the books. So the books I'm going to mention 
not in order of how much I love them, but in the order that I read them. And I'm also not going to go too far into detail about what the book's about because I have previously talked about them in wrap ups. So let's get started. So the first book on this list is The Light Pirate by Lily Brooks Dalton. I remember discovering this book and featuring it on a, one of my videos of new releases that I'm really excited about. And I'm so happy that it ended up being as good as I expected it to be. This I would classify as climate fiction, but there is so much more to this book with the characters and the story. This mostly follows Wanda, but the story opens uh, with Wanda being in her mother's womb. It really kind of starts with Wanda's parents and her stepbrothers. They live in a small town in Florida, and this is in the not too distant future where climate change is wreaking havoc on the world, specifically on coastal uh, areas where the ocean is getting bigger and bigger. There are more and more hurricanes and with that comes destruction and Wanda is born in the middle of a hurricane. And because of that, a lot of things happen in her family at the time of her birth that have lasting effects on Wanda's life. And you follow Wanda as she grows and she is struggling to survive as the world continues to circle the drain. There's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of magical realism in this book, but I don't think it's for magical realism's sake. I think it's just kind of how Wanda communicates with nature. This is just one of those books that will break your heart and put it back together and then break your heart and then put it back together. It's also one of those books where you're having such a good time following this wonderful, wonderful character, but then there are these events that happen that are incredibly terrifying and not in a horror novel sense of a way, but just what's happening to the world and how realistic it is. I just enjoyed the heck out of this book. I absolutely loved it. If memory serves, I'm pretty sure this was a debut novel, so I'm so looking forward to what the author does next. Absolutely deserves a spot on this list. Next up is Midnight is the Darkest Hour by Ashley Winstead. I had such an amazing time with this book. I read it as an arc. I'm not even sure, has this I think this just recently came out. If you are already Ashley Winstead fans and you haven't read this book yet, uh, you've got a treat coming up. It was my first Ashley Winstead and yeah, I immediately added her to other books to my TBR. This is a mystery thriller and it takes place in a small southern town and you're following Ruth. Ruth is the town librarian. She is the daughter of the town preacher. And it's one of those small towns where everybody's kind of God-fearing and everybody goes to church. But at the same time, there are these myths that haunt the town and have haunted the town for many years about this man. I think it's called the Low Man. And he sneaks into people's houses at night on moonless nights and kills them. So Ruth has always felt like an outsider, but it's her best friend Everett who actually has a reputation of having a dark past. But they also together have a dark past. And when a skull is found in the town swamp next to some weird carvings in the trees, the town goes a little nuts. And this event makes Ruth and Everett nervous for reasons. And they get together to try to figure out what is happening and who the skull belongs to, why they were killed, and how it's connected to an event that's happened in their past. From page one, I was sucked in by this story. Her writing is that good. I was just completely taken aback and was left asking myself, why haven't I read an Ashley Winstead yet, especially since mystery thrillers are my thing. I don't know what took me so long, but I'm so glad I read this book and equally glad that it made this list. This next book won't come as a surprise to any of you who watch my videos because I seem to remember very clearly how much I gushed about it. And that is Iona Iverson's Rules for Commuting by Claire Pooley. This book took me by surprise. I can't even remember how it got my attention, but I listened to it and it was very well narrated. I would call it literary fiction. You're of course following Iona and she is a 50 something year old woman. She was a very popular advice columnist in the UK. 
and she's kind of found herself falling out of relevance as she gets older. And she takes the same commuter train to work every day, has done so for years, and she sees the same people commuting to work. But there is an unwritten rule, really, on commuting that you don't acknowledge anybody else on the train until one day one of the commuters that Iona has seen all the time uh, chokes on his breakfast and Iona and about five or six other commuters come to help this particular passenger. And through this event, friendships are formed and people get to know each other. Connections are made. It's just a really wonderful story about how important human connection is and about how people are rarely what they seem on the surface. And another thing that I absolutely loved about this book that I remember also talking about it in my wrap up is that the protagonist is a 50, I believe she's 57 years old and she's the star of the show. And that just doesn't happen very often. Usually you're following women in their 30s and it's kind of portrayed as that's the prime of life. And it's just such a fallacy in writing, I think. And of course I notice it more because I'm in my 50s and you know, I understand what it feels like to be considered irrelevant. It's a painful part of life. But the author did just such a fantastic job of just showing how Iona is her own woman. She's outspoken. She's got her own style. She's smart. She's got something to say about things. I absolutely fell in love with Iona and I hope you do too. I knew as soon as I finished this book, it was going to be on my favorites list. So <laughs> there you go. This next one won't be a surprise to you either because I absolutely loved this book and it also took me by surprise, even though the author is one of my favorites. And the book I'm talking about is Triptych by Karen Slaughter. I was only surprised by how much I loved it, as much as a crime thriller would allow me to do. But I really shouldn't be surprised because Karen Slaughter is just a genius. Triptych is the first in the Will Trent series. And oh, one thing I wanted to mention, I got so many comments after I talked about this book. There's so many Karen Slaughter fans out there, uh, specifically the Will Trent series. And then you, there's so many of you out there who recommended the Grant County series as well. And I believe I've responded to all of you, but I have started, I've read the first one in, in the Grant County series, Blindsided, I believe it's called. I did enjoy Blindsided, but I have to say, I really love Triptych even more so. But anyway, back to Triptych. So Will Trent is an investigator with the Georgia Bureau of Investigations. And I believe all of the books take place in Atlanta, which that was an extra fun thing for me now that I am currently a resident of Georgia. But there's a little bit more to Will's personality than just being a cop. He has all these wonderful little quirks that just give his character depth and make him so likable. He's also dyslexic, which gives him kind of a vulnerability, especially being in law enforcement. And that's one of the things that I forgot to talk about in my wrap up of this book. I would have to say that that would be the only criticism I had about this book. Being somebody who was previously in law enforcement, I didn't think it was very realistic for somebody who was dyslexic to be as successful in law enforcement, if even possible to be in law enforcement if you're dyslexic, because they're so much reading and writing involved. I thought that was just a little bit unrealistic, but I overlooked it because the story's so great and Will's so great. So I just wanted to mention that here. Anyways, Will doesn't even come into the story until, I don't even know, I listened to it, so I don't know how many pages in, but a whole lot goes on before Will enters the picture. And you're following a string of murders. Someone is murdering women and not only murdering them, but a specific type of mutilation. And the cop who is on the case, Michael Ormwood, he is a veteran investigator. You learn a little bit about him. And then you also learn about Angie Pulaski, who is a vice cop who has been friends with Will for many, many years. And they have kind of a history together. They both grew up in the foster system. And then you're also following John Shelley, who has just been released from prison for murdering his teenage friend. He was in prison for 20 years. You're following him and he discovers through a series of events that somebody has stolen his identity and is using his name and his social security number. And he starts to kind of go on a quest of why would anybody want to use 
the identity of somebody who spent his entire adult life in prison. And so as you're following John Shelley, find out who stole his identity, and you're following Michael Ormwood's investigation of the serial killer of women, the stories start to converge and enter Will Trent onto the case, and it goes from there. And there are some delicious twists in this book, and the pacing is perfect. The characters are each engaging in their own right. Angie, I absolutely love Angie. She is a straight shooter. I love her snarkiness. I love her relationship with Will. I can't wait to get on to the next in the series. I have the second one on hold on my Libby app, and... I'm here for it. This is a series that I am absolutely going to get through. And I'm even more excited that I'm so far behind in the series because I'm not going to have to wait for any of them. I know so many of you out there are Karen Slaughter fans, but if you haven't read Karen Slaughter, what are you doing with your life? So we're to the fifth book on my favorites for the third quarter. Any guesses on what it could be? I have to say I had this list created probably two weeks ago. And it changed just recently. One book changed. And I went back and forth of either, well, am I going to add a sixth book to this list? Or am I going to have two books in a tie? I just, I was going back and forth and I just decided, you know what? No, if I'm having that much of a struggle of adding this particular book to this list and I knew which one it was going to tie with, then I knew which one was going to go off and which one was going to come on and it, the decision kind of made itself. So the book that was originally on this list that didn't make the cut, I'm sad to say, was The Collective Regrets of Clover by Mickey Brammer. I absolutely love that book, but a book that I read more recently, and that was another thing that I battled with, asking myself, am I just leaning towards this one because my feelings are more recent? Maybe. But I made an executive decision. It's my channel. I'll do what I want. <laughs> I have to say, most of you reminded me of that, and I thank you for it. Anyways, what book am I talking about? What book booted the Collector Regrets of Clover off this list? It's none other than Pet by Catherine Chigi. I talked about this book in my most recent wrap-up. This one took me by surprise. It was my first Catherine Chigi, and as I mentioned in my wrap-up, I discovered Catherine Chigi through my beloved Women's Prize for Fiction when her remote sympathy made the long list last year. And I've been meaning to get to that book. Of course, you know, life happens and I haven't gotten to it yet. But after reading Pet, it has definitely moved up my TBR. This one follows Justine and she is a 12 year old girl. She lives in New Zealand. She goes to a Catholic school. She's re being raised by her dad and she's dealing with the death of her mother that happened, I believe, a year prior. But most of the story happens in Justine's classroom at school, how everybody absolutely adores their teacher, Mrs. Price. Everybody loves Mrs. Price because she is beautiful, she's sexy, she's mysterious, she's glamorous, she calls everybody my darling, and everybody is just clamoring to be Mrs. Price's pet, and Justine is included. And not long after Justine becomes Mrs. Price's most recent pet, Items start going missing. Individual items that belong to the students in class, personal items start to go missing. And, and that coupled with Mrs. Price's unique, uncanny ability to manipulate pits all the students against each other and bad things happen. There is so much more to this book that I failed to talk about in my wrap up. Like Justine has a seizure disorder and the fact that she can't remember anything during the aftermath of a seizure is connected to this story. Mrs. Price has a mysterious past where her husband and daughter died in a car accident, but that's all that people know. People don't know if Mrs. Price was in the car when it happened and they don't know any other circumstances. Mrs. Price also has a locked room in her house, kind of like Blackbeard. Justine is kind of wondering what's going on behind this locked door. If you're wondering what is Justine doing in Mrs. Price's house, well, that's a whole nother thing that happens. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot going on in the story than what I told you in the wrap up. There's a scene with the class pet that happens that nearly destroyed me. There's a lot. There's a lot, folks. But what is important for you guys to know is that this is beautifully written. It is 
got an incredibly creepy vibe. There is a delicious twist. I cannot recommend this book enough. And after I finished the book, I wanted to read more and more about Catherine Chigi and her background. She's from New Zealand. While she is lesser known in the United States, she is a huge literary star in New Zealand and rightfully so. She might not be underrated over there, but she is definitely underrated in the United States. And I will continue to sing her praises. She's fantastic. My plan is to read all of her stuff. I think she's just going to be one of those authors for me. Giving Chef's Kiss is such a cliche now, but this book, Chef's Kiss. So that is it. Those are my five favorite books for the third quarter of the year. Have you read any of these books? Are you excited to read any of these books now? I certainly hope so. You will do yourself favors if you read any one of these books. Do you guys have a favorite book that you've read in the past three months that you'd like to share with me? I would love to hear about it. Or you could just say hi down in the doodly doo. If you're still watching at this point, please consider giving that like button a boop and a subscribe would be absolutely wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.